Good afternoon, everyone. It's Dr. Heather Denniston with the Junk You Should Know show at its usual time and place, Fridays at noon PST on the Facebook or Facebook page for Wealth and Fed. And today, I seriously, I'm I'm like a little kid, uh, like maybe it's Santa or maybe it's something, but I've got Sarah Wells with me here today, and I've been looking forward to this ever since I met her several weeks ago at an event we were both at. And Sarah, thank you so much for uh, dedicating some time to us today. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited that you are here. No worries. Happy but, to be here. Wonderful. Now, just before we be, get get going, we're going to be talking about Sarah's journey through the hurdling industry and profession, and we're talk about some adversity there and talk about things she overcame and and most importantly we're going to be talking about what she's doing now with her believe initiative and so we're going to get to that in just a minute but let me just comment uh i've got two things to tell you people number one is the sponsor as always is the change cave change cave is a 12 module online learning institute for women over 40 who are ready to ignite passion and inspire first steps to their next wellness ambition and so there will be a link in the comments for that if you want to find out more about it it's just 29.99 a month cancelable at any time Time, and it is a fantastic program, so please come and join us. Secondly, I want to let you know that I am giving away a free copy of my book today. So if you go to bit.ly backslash three day free, you can have a copy of the three day reset for free. And so do go ahead and click on that. But first of all, stay with me as we introduce Sarah Wells. Sarah, you are, well, first of all, as soon as I saw you at this event, I'm like, okay, first of all, she's Canadian. She's super cool. She's very confident. I didn't even really know anything about you. And then I find out all this other jazz that you're doing. And so you're, you're uh, by, by trade, you are an Olympic hurdler. And so tell me a little bit about way back when, when did the spark happen? How did you get involved with this? Well, first of all, let me tell you, I hurdled like four times in high school <laughs> and I smashed my knee so bad. I thought, who the hell? hell wants to do this and yeah, I'm like, crazy oh, people. I'm <laughs> but I'm not going to jump over stuff like <laughs> so yeah. tell me who talked you into jumping over these little gates yeah so when I was in high school I had tried out for almost like every single team basketball volleyball badminton soccer I was like okay hey, I'm gonna find a sport I'm gonna be like a sporty girl and got cut from every single team. Like every single time I'd like walk into the gym, like, oh, maybe I made this team. Look for my name, never there. So finally spring rolls around and in gym class, I had a teacher come up to me who happened to also be a varsity hurdles coach at the University of Toronto. And so he sees me in gym class and he's like, you need to do the sport of track and field. And initially I'm thinking like, no, I'm the least athletic human on the planet. I've <laughs> team this year. But I went out for the team anyways, and he showed me hurdles. And hurdles made running way more fun. You know, like, there's a t-shirt that says running sucks, and it's because it does. It truly does. <laughs> um, but hurdles made it really fun for me. So I started to, to race in, in this, like, new thing that I had discovered. And within the first eight months of training with that high school teacher slash varsity coach at University of Toronto, um, we made my very first national team, and I went to Marrakesh, Morocco to compete for Canada. Oh, my so God. Then, okay, well, I guess I'm kind of good at this then. He was yeah. right. And that coach and teacher and myself stayed coach athlete for the next nine years oh until we made the Olympics together. Oh, so, my God. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, and, are, and are you still close to that person? Yes, very much. Um, we, we talk quite frequently. His name is Dave Hunt. I'm sure he'll watch this on Facebook later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and thanks, yeah. And two things on that. Thanks, Dave, for uh, believing in uh, unexposed talent. And <laughs> thank you, yeah. Sarah, for being such a great example of, you know, there's a lot of girls out there that try out for something, they don't make it, and they're like, I'm done. Yeah. And uh, and you just don't know. And so we have to just keep trying to find what our mojo is. And I love that you said that you're like, I'm not very athletic. I got cut from every other team. And then you yeah. found something that's like one of the most athletic things somebody can do. And yeah. uh, I think that's just so beautiful. Now you, uh, I think you is it came first in the Pan Am Games out of Toronto? Silver. So I have a silver Silver, silver there. Okay. And then you also hold the record for uh, under 17, right? 
Yeah, in Canada. I, I don't even. I haven't even looked at that in a long time. Okay, but that's awesome. I, <laughs> I, was, I was googling you. I, I LinkedIn stalked you, and uh, so there was there was a couple other ones. Obviously, you uh, went to the Olympics in London in 2012, yes. and uh, our training for the upcoming 2020 Olympics uh, mm -hmm. to go again, which is just super. And um, and so, what does training look like, by the way? Like, wh what's your schedule for that? Sure. So um, we train about five days a week. Um, our like really big and tough workouts can take like four hours. And okay. before I was like, oh my God, you run for four hours? But by no means am I like just running for four hours. Right. Um, there's a bunch that goes into a workout. So our warm up alone can take like 45 minutes to an hour. Oh, wow. And um, then from there, we'll do different kind of like sprint drilling and making sure we're doing like plyometrics and like reaction time to get up the, the ground appropriately. And then for me as a hurdler, of course, there's there's hurdle drills and technique. And okay. then we'll move into our actual workout section of the workout, <laughs> which will be potentially yeah. intervals or usually like, yeah, depending on the time of year, but that stage is like, that's where you work to potentially make yourself sick. And yeah. so, the pink zone, uh, as my husband calls it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that will be the grit and like the chunk of the workout. Following that, we may do a circuit um, of different like exercises, strengthening all the little things within your body. Med ball exercises where you toss like that heavy, a heavy basketball is essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we have weights in the weight room, which will be Got it. exercise will vary depending on, again, the day. Um, and then kind of cool down. Recovery is obviously important, so fuel right yeah. after, and um, if possible, if training didn't wrap up too late, or the clinic might still be open, then you can go get treatment, or yeah. kind of work that in for another day as well. So yeah, it's it's a job, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a job that doesn't that doesn't end. It's like I'm sure it's like I, I'm not a mother, but I'm sure it's yeah. like being. <laughs> yeah. um, it's just like you're never off the clock because every single choice will play into your next workout. So Oh, that's a that's a very, very good point. So it's not like when yeah. you walk off the track, you're like, I'm going for burger and fries. Yeah, like I'm um, done now, like yeah. athlete time over. It's right. Like, you know, every single meal you make, the choice to kind of go out with friends. Well, like, well, is that food gonna be really like yeah. clean and great fuel for tomorrow's workout? And if you yeah. stay out a bit later, then like will you get the best sleep? And yeah. Um, if you you're not Mm -hmm. go, go ahead if you're not oh if you're not like kind of in recovery state if you're like out and about even just like the stimulation alone can be taxing on your nervous system which can play into your next workout and so yeah it's a lot of little things that might not seem like a big deal like oh i'm just sitting at a restaurant with friends like that's recovery but it's it's not because yes. the stimulation and the potential food that you're eating and all of those things and so that's where that's yeah it's kind of a job that doesn't end <laughs> yeah and it's such a great example because when you take it to that level, then you can go back down to our level and say, yes, that is, that's obviously true for an Olympian, but to, for some of us, that's or not for some, for all of us, that's also true, meaning every choice you make is either going in one direction or the other in regard to your wellness. And so, you know, the food you eat is how you're gonna perceive your next day. The how you sleep is gonna be how you love your kids the next day. It's, you know, it's going to be, it plays into it and you're such a great fine tuned, such a clear example of, oh yeah, like that every little thing counts for you and it actually does for us too. So, but you're, it's just so much more obvious for you when you like bonk in the middle of a workout um, and you know why, cause you ate something or you didn't sleep or you were stressed or whatever it was. So. Uh, that's a that's a very good example. Yeah, I saw something in my in my talks quite quite frequently about how you have to make choices, not sacrifices, uh -huh. and simply the fact that like on the path to any goal, like you said, whether it's like your goal is to be a really great mother, or it's to be a badass woman in the in the boardroom, or whether it's to be yeah. an athlete, that all of those goals are going to require a certain level of choice, and yeah. frequently when we in our careers we then look at the choices that we have to make. As sacrifices to everything else. Yeah. When in actuality, it's it's simply another choice. Just and a choice. Yeah. 
And it takes it takes the emo yeah it takes the emotion out of it. And I think uh, anybody who is successful in wellness pursuits has left that all behind. Where I can't have sugar, and I can't you know, and it's all negative. Once you see it as an adult choice, and it's like, well, you can choose either one. They're neither of them are emotional. It's just one choice or the other, and it's an a, a, a specific outcome based on what you choose. It's all it is, just math. Mm. And, uh, and so mm. I love that you say that. That's yeah. Great. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's me, awesome. Tell me a little bit about. Um, I know you and I have kind of brushed on the topic of you know this wasn't a smooth sail for you. I mean, yes, you uh, your talent was discovered quickly. You advanced quickly, um, but it it didn't go without any bumps along the road. So give me a little example of because for someone out there, they might go, "It's so easy for Sarah." Yeah. Um, certainly. Yeah. When people see Olympic athletes or hear the title, they think like, okay, well, you must have always been good. And I kind of almost fueled that fire by saying within eight months, I made my first national team. And well, yes, it, there was an element of showing me that I had what it took in order to achieve this success. There certainly was a lot of roller coaster riding through the mix. And um, the biggest kind of dip or obstacle I had to face came the year before the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And I had been training, you know, since that first day when the high school teacher saw me in grade nine and said, do the sport for the next eight years, I had been training to try to pursue this big goal. And um, the year before the 2012 Olympics, I was at a training camp in January of 2011 and I was doing two a day workouts and in the best shape of my life at this point, like was really crushing things. And so I was like, okay, this goal is in reach. And even though at that time I had never touched the Olympic standard, I knew that, you know, I'm all, I'm taking steps towards it. And like, this is possible and this is exciting. So if I keep going, like this could happen. And at that training camp, the morning after the biggest workout of the week, I step out of bed and I have this really unusual pain in the back of my leg. And so at first I'm thinking like, okay, don't freak out. This is hopefully just something small, a hamstring tweak, something I did the day before. Um, hopefully it'll go away quickly. But unfortunately, to my frustration, it doesn't really go away. And it's confusing because the muscle itself is actually really strong. But every single time I go to jog or start to accelerate or slow down, I get this shooting pain at my leg. Oh. So I flew home from this training camp and went to see a sports medicine doctor in Toronto. And we found out that it wasn't my muscle, that it was my bone. And I had developed a stress fracture in my femur. And so oh, a stress variation of your bone from the inside out that eventually leads to a crack. Well, and it's it's the biggest, strongest bone in your body. So I mean, yeah, that's exactly. that's incredible. And let me just say, hi, Jessamine. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you guys for joining us. So continue on, Sarah, because that that's uh, that is an unusual injury, and I have no idea how. I mean, other than bone stimulator and rest, how they how they helped you with that? Yeah, that was pretty much the only thing that they could suggest is a bone stimulator, which is this weird machine that apparently is emitting frequency down to your bone, but you don't feel anything. The machine is very expensive to buy <laughs> and you just put it on there. You're like, I hope this is worth my money. Um, and so, yeah, I had that. And um, at first the doctor told me it'd be about three months. So he's like, okay, go away, try to yeah. stop it, try to stay motivated, come back in three months. And during that three months, I truthfully questioned, you know, I'd never touched Olympic standards. So was I, was this going to be possible after I sit down for three months? Yeah. And was I worth anything if I didn't get this big goal? Because suddenly I've weighed so heavily, like put my whole identity into achieving this goal. And now that it's potentially out of, out of my cards that I'm, I'm just, I'm so yeah. lost. Yeah. And so I get through the three months, like deepest, darkest days of my mm. career. And I go back and I see the doctor. I'm like, okay, I've made it through. Thank God. Can I go? Can I train? And he looks at me and he's like, Mm -hmm. sorry, Sarah, the bone's actually still not healed. Come back in another month. Oh. And I'm absolutely heartbroken because I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, you don't know how hard it was for me to get through these three months. Like, I cannot do that. Yeah. But I go away and I cross train and I try to stay fit and I try to stay motivated. And eventually I come back and I'm like, okay, I've made it through another month. Like, I'm the strongest human. Like, <laughs> And I go, I see the doctor. He says, mm, sorry, Sarah, bone's still not healed. This ends up going on for nine months. Oh, jeez. So it was just, you know, every single month that he said, come back, I would climb to the top of the mountain thinking this was the time. Yeah. And then I would just fall off the edge of the cliff, just heartbroken. And Aww. 
So by the time the entire nine months had gone by and I thought about quitting and I watched teammates and friends get better and stronger and faster. And I was reminded by everyone around me to remain realistic that mm -hmm. I had already, you know, had this impossible dream on this plan. And now I had made it even more unrealistic for me to achieve it by sitting yeah. down the last nine months. And so I started like, it did get to me and absolutely it weighed on me. And I thought they're right. Like, how could I even think this is possible? Should I stop telling people that this is a goal of mine? And oh. finally, after making it through those nine months on my very first day back to training, I remember the exact day. It was October 4th, 2011. Oh my God. And I left my very first practice. I was so excited to just have like be back. Um, I left and I got the word believe tattooed onto my wrist. Oh, and that I is said, so cool. When I make the Olympic games, I will put the Olympic rings underneath here. Oh. And so I just kind of like keep telling myself like, yes, everyone's telling me it's impossible. And like, yes, they're right. That physiologically I am doing nothing to prove that I have taken any steps towards this goal. Mm -hmm. But what I have been doing is strengthening a muscle that people can't see. Mm -hmm. And that was this belief in myself. Mm -hmm. And so I start training and one month in, I actually am doing a hurdle drill and I like snap down over the hurdle and I feel this huge sharp pain in my abdomen and I like freak out right away. I walk over to my coach. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what I just did. Like, I can't be hurt again. I just got back. <laughs> like, this is crazy. And I go back in to see that dang doctor and we find out I did give myself a hernia and I now have to go in for surgery to recover. <sighs> So I go into surgery. I recover from that. My next new first day back to training is December 16th, 2011. And Olympic trials are six months later. Oh my gosh. And I'm working with Orton tattooed believe onto my wrist. So yeah. I'm like, oh, let's do this. And I'm like, oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So then I start training. And at first it's just like really pathetic jogging and then it's actually jogging and then it's hurdle drills again and then it's sprinting and racing and getting faster and then winning races and getting faster. And six months later, I win the Olympic trials, I go to the Olympic games and I finish as an Olympic semifinalist and I put the Olympic rings underneath that exactly where it meant the most to me. Oh, that's so amazing. That's such a great story. Thanks. And I, I love that you, you know, during the time of adversity, when most people kind of give up, you use that as the opportunity to build up your reserve of belief in yourself. And that's that's incredibly powerful. And it's always something we can be working on no matter where you find yourself, what situation you find yourself in. So that's that is so amazing. Now that leads us well, and we're gonna come back to a little bit more about your your sport, but you have started this incredible movement called the Believe Initiative, and you have partnered with Royal Bank, and uh, I'd like you to just tell me about it. I, everything I learn about it, I'm just getting more and more excited about it. So share with me kind of, and the viewers, what exactly is the Believe Initiative? So the Believe Initiative goes into schools and communities, and we talk about the importance of being resilient and the power of believing in yourself. And it's been an amazing program. Like, honestly, it's like, I never thought I would find anything as much as I love the sport of track and field. And I am so fulfilled by this program and inspired by these students that have done incredible things. So basically when we go in, I use that story that I've kind of shared with you about the believe. Plus there's a whole other side from 2016, but we won't get into that yet. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> showcase the story arc of everything I've had to do as an Olympic athlete and the importance of being resilient, the power of believing in yourself. From that, we actually have the students apply the lessons that they learn, whether it's in a keynote or it's on a full summit day. We have kind of different tiers of programming that schools can choose to register for. And from that, they then apply these lessons to a Believe Passion project. And that can be anything. It can be if they're interested in dogs, if they're interested in shoes, if they're interested in books, photography, acting, whatever it is, they choose what they're very passionate about. And then they believe in themselves enough to apply that to make a difference. And we've seen an incredible impact from these like these young students. They're in like grade seven or eight and they're doing in, uh, like amazing things. So to give you an example of a passion project, um, one student, his, his passion was shoes and sneakers. And he said, you know, I, I think I'm going to use this to then provide. I know what I feel like when I get a new pair of shoes and how great that feels. 
So uh, he went on his school announcements, asked students to bring in their shoes that they didn't want anymore, got sneaker cleaning kits to clean them up, and then donated them to a youth shelter for students who never be able to afford cool shoes. Oh and my gosh. Like, so amazing that this is something that, you know, he suddenly realized that he could make a difference. Even as a grade seven student, he could make a difference. Yeah. Um, another young girl had a passion for photography and animals. And so she took pictures of dogs and made calendars, got pre-orders from her family and friends in order to make a profit enough to provide, she wanted to get a shot for an animal so it'd be more likely to be adopted. Oh yeah. Dogs are very expensive, we all know. Yes. The Humane Society was super sweet and gave her a list of things that um, she could afford, like this is how much money we need to raise for this and this and this and this. And so then she kind of set her sights on the new goal to help these animals in the shelter. And so the whole premise of the Believe Initiative is what if you believe you could? Yeah. What skills would you explore? What passions would you develop? Because so many youth are so scared of the fact that like, if I don't love coding, then there's going to be so much like disruption in the world. And, and I need to, I need to have my whole life figured out in grade seven because, you know, I need to know what career, what university I'm yeah. going to. And, and we just want to tell them like, what, what if you believe you could like, what would, yeah. what would you explore and, and, and use that because that's where you're going to make your greatest impact is when yeah. you're doing something you really love. And yeah. Especially like with like using myself as the example, I started track and field because I thought I was kind of good at it and then kept doing that. And I went, I chose to go to school for kinesiology because I liked to enjoy, like I liked learning what was happening to my body during training. Yeah. And I think because I knew it was happening to my body in training, it helped me maybe squeeze out that extra 1% of my training that allowed me to then become an Olympic athlete. Because of yeah. an and I have this platform, and I get to start this um, incredible organization. Yeah. And so I try to share with them that, like, I didn't know the plan. I didn't have a ten-year, like, long-term goal. This is what I know I'm going to do. I just was doing stuff I love to do. Yeah. And every and each time, it led me to the next step, and it led me to the next step. And the entire time, I feel like I was able to have my greatest impact because I felt so passionately about it. Yeah. So the students now are pursuing these belief passion projects, having incredible impacts. Um, thanks to RBC being our supporter, we've now spoke to 30,000 students across oh the country. Gosh. That's so incredible. And I love that you're focusing on um, helping them discover what they're passionate about and believing enough in themselves that um, th this doesn't need to be somebody else's thing. This can be your thing and you can yeah. move forward with this. And I, I just think that's so great. And I completely see like, this opening up and there's, I don't know if you have it yet, but I could just see a page of just, here's all the passion projects that have happened and stuff. I mean, that would be so cool yeah. to see. Yeah, so that's actually, we launched it just a month ago. So oh. we have a few passion projects up there, but this year, everyone who does a passion project um, is asked to then upload their, like a one minute video of them describing what they did to this passion project page. So- Oh, I love it. It's believeinitiative.com and you click the inspiration page. Yeah, and a bunch of the passion projects will be listed there. Okay, that's very cool. And again, that's believeinitiative.com. And Sarah also has some videos on YouTube. She has a YouTube channel as well. There's lots of information there. Um, but the believeinitiative.com would be a great place to go. And uh, I just, I love that so much. And you and I met at the, um, it was a public speaking conference. And uh, Sarah got up there and shared some of the story and I, I knew that I just had to grab her and, and find out more about it because it's just, I think of all the kids I've run into as a chiropractor who uh, they, their default is to feel defeated yeah. and, um, and that they don't have a lot of confidence in themselves and that they do feel like I have to do what everybody else is telling me I need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I love that you are out there and you're speaking to their hearts and you're telling them, no, uh, you know what, what you need to do, you just need to believe it and, and move forward with it. It's really, really fantastic. So who have been some of the mentors in your life? Since you are being such a mentor to, to so many people, who are some of the people that have just really impacted you? So honestly, I've been so lucky to have such amazing people around me, even starting this organization, like without the people that have helped me, I would never be in this position. So um, first off, a major mentor was definitely that teacher slash coach, um, Dave Hunt, who got me into the sport. Like I would never believe in myself without him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then the entire, like all, all my coaches at University of Toronto honestly have been incredible and helped me get and achieve the athletic success, success I've had. Um, also within sport, kind of who I idolized growing up was Perdita Felician. And 
she was a hurdler and she is a 10 time national champion. She was ranked number one in the world at one point in the hundred meter hurdles. And she was just really great to look up to. And, and as I got to know her a bit more near the end of her career and near the beginning of my career, she was more than happy to take a call if I needed to talk oh. or learn from her experience. And so, um, yeah, I've actually just seen her recently last week, which is awesome. Um, That's great. Yeah, she's really wonderful. Um, and then outside of sport, like with this program, the Believe Initiative, I've had an incredible speaking mentor, Ron Tite, who we both saw at the speaking conference we were at. Best speaker uh, on the planet. He's yeah. so good. It's incredible. Like, I was like, tell me what to do. I'll do anything you say. Like, yeah. You're me. <laughs> yeah, that's really great that you got um, in under his wing. It's fantastic. Yeah, I feel very fortunate. Um, and then certainly um, someone else I met through through running, his kids also are part of the same club that I am part of. And he kind of really helped me with my, my marketing and branding and really understanding the value in that. Uh, and then obviously, like, I, I feel bad like shouting the name out so frequently, but like Royal Bank of Canada has been yeah. like the best partner of all time because yeah. they've helped me grow this organization. And many people on their staff in on the marketing team have just been so supportive and yeah. they really walk the talk of, of wanting to support these grassroots initiatives and get involved in the community. And so I have to say so that like, thank you so much to them. Too. Yeah. And, and, and what we didn't mention, which we did off camera is that believe initiative is a one woman show at the moment. You're doing every, you're sending all the emails, you're writing all the content, you're <laughs> doing the videos, you're doing all that stuff yourself. And it won't be that way for long. No, but right, now, right now you are. And so, uh, so if you had to say, uh, is Believe Initiative um, your day job and training is your side hustle or is training your day job and Believe Initiative is your side hustle? It honestly on the day, it, like we'll flip back and forth. Like I'm still in my workout clothes because I just came from training. Like like <laughs> 10 minutes before we got this call, I just came home, like threw down my clothes. I was like, OK, I'm ready. Um, I, I, I actually witnessed like sweatshirts coming yeah, off and Gatorade <laughs> bottles going everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, like sweat. Yeah. No, I think it's awesome. You, uh, so the priorities certainly like shift on the daily. Um, but where my heart lies at this point is like split 50, 50. I love training and I have got to meet incredible people and go to incredible places because of my sport. But I am also finding how fulfilled and how much I love doing this organization and meeting these students and being inspired by what they're doing. So, um, Neither one of them are a side hustle at this point. Yeah, like, yeah, and the Blue Nation, because I am kind of a one woman show right now, it's uh, definitely be time consuming to yeah, no <laughs> get it up and running. But, you know, there's you a, know, lot, a, a lot of people a who. Lot of people. Hold on one sec. I just got to unplug my headphones for a sec. You hear me, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay I'm just getting okay, just get um, um, <laughs> A lot of people talk about. It's, there's this new word like multi-passionate and, and somebody saying, well, I'm a multi-passionate and I'm like, no, everybody's multi-passionate. Yeah. You know, like you, like you've got these two things that you love equally well and that are so inspiring to you and that motivate you and the others around you. And I'm the same. And I think we all have that. And it's just about discovering them, growing them, giving your time to them and, um, making sure that you're making room in your life for them because it's easy to get them to be squeezed out and put on the back burner. Um, so I, I love that so much. So with the Believe Initiative, it's believeinitiative.com. If somebody wants to be involved, what does that look like? Like, are they hiring you to come speak at their school? Are they sending you, like, is it donations? Or like, what? what how do people get involved? Certainly. So um, at, through believeinitiative.com, we have a contact us page. They can reach out, we have our kind of a list of different programmings because you could have myself or one of our Believe Ambassadors come in and do a keynote speech to your school, your organization, your corporate audience, no matter what it is. Um, then the second is that you can be a part of our Believe Complete program, which uses both the kind of big event that sparks that what if you believe you could, and then apply that with the Believe Passion Project itself. And then for teachers, we actually have created a Believe unit where it's kind of like we're more hands off and they can take the Believe unit and use it in their classrooms. It's directly tied into Ministry of Education curriculum. Um, we're doing it in four school boards this year and one, we'll be doing it in two provinces, B.C. and Ontario. And so um, you can actually then like 
take the core curriculum and build out these passion projects with the intent to have everyone uploading their projects to this Believe Passion Project Hub. Oh and God. then we'll be oh featuring God. a bunch of students that are doing these incredible things like flying our camera crew out there to um, hopefully like showcase these incredible projects. That's so. That's, that's Thank so, you. So, and I want to say, yeah, I want to say, I'm um, talking kind of talking about, about <laughs> but you do a lot of this stuff. You do a lot of this everything you do. You're starting to do more speaking and more business initiatives in the U.S. So, um, don't be shy. If you're in the U.S., Sarah and her team are happy to come and get involved with your school or your corporation down stateside as well. Yeah, please reach out. It would be awesome. Super excited to grow this, hopefully. And, uh, yeah. Um, I feel lucky to have this as the yeah. my next step. It's really great. And Sarah, I know uh, doing what you do can be all-consuming, and the fact that you are taking your time to develop and grow this to give back to others is super powerful. Um, I know you don't feel – maybe you do, but you're a young woman still, and it's so great to see – younger women just going, I'm going to like do this amazing thing. And I'm super proud of you, even though we really don't know each other that well. I just think so highly of you. And uh, I'm really, really pleased you were able to come on the show today. Um, Sarah, I will ask that you and I both just keep an eye on the comments because I know people will have questions after the show. And so we'll put some links down there. And uh, Sarah, if you'll put your Be Live initiative link down there, uh, that would be great. And, uh, and we'll put some other links too. So you guys, seriously, just check out the website at least and uh, look around there because all of us know a school or they know a corporation or they have a benefit from the program. So um, she can continue to do her great work. Can you still hear me there, Sarah? Yes, sorry, it's a bit delayed, but yes, I heard yeah. that. Thank you so much. That's, that's okay. Thank you. This is awesome. I know it's a really, sure. really bad old film where I'm talking and then it's not connected. Yeah, sorry, I don't know. I don't know why it's, what's happening. Yeah, that's just that's me. So it's my side. Anyway, Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show. We will, as I said, put links below. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to share this with family and friends at the very minimum. And uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be around to answer questions after the show. Thank you, Sarah. And we look forward to seeing more from you. And good luck in 2020. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. We'll see you later. Bye.